you would take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Kings chapter number 18. 2 Kings chapter number 18. And we are going to be studying the life of Hezekiah this evening. And Hezekiah was used by the Lord uh, to see one of the great revivals in Scripture. So we're going we're gonna, to uh, look uh, to Scripture uh, this evening on the topic of trusting God for revival. Trusting God for revival. So I'm in two locations tonight. I'm going to be in 2 Kings 18. And also, if you, if you have... Uh, uh, one of these strings in your Bibles like I do. Maybe you can put another one in Second Chronicles 29. I don't know what that's called, a tassel, um, perhaps. Second Chronicles 29, and we'll be there as well. But we'll start off in Second Kings number 18. So hopefully you've had a chance to find your spot there. Would you stand with me as we re- read God's Word together in Second Kings chapter number 18? Second Kings 18 and verse number one, it says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Eli, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abbi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down groves and break into pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made for unto those days the children of Israel that burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. But uh, verse number five, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah nor any that were before him. For he clave unto the Lord and departed not from following him, but he kept his commandments and the Lord, uh, which the Lord commanded Moses. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this portion of Scripture that we have in front of us. God, would you guard our, uh, guide our hearts and our mind as we work through these passages uh, to see you. And God, I just pray that we would be prepared, a, be, a people prepared for revival because of the time spent in your word tonight. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I don't know about you, I've, I've enjoyed the rain the last few weeks in the Antelope Valley. In fact, whenever it's raining, I, I ask people that are around me, do you like the rain? And uh, some people do, and some people don't. I especially like the rain because it's such a novelty here. We don't get very much rain here in the desert. My daughter, Quinn, she got an umbrella for Christmas from my, my mom gave it to her, and she got this umbrella, and I was thinking, that's a nice gift. She'll never use it. We live in the desert. And sure enough, whenever it rains now, she runs to her bedroom and she grabs that umbrella and she holds the umbrella out and then she holds her arm out. She wants to feel that it's still raining as she holds this little cute pink umbrella over her. And, and I think just because we're not used to it, uh, it's especially refreshing here in the desert. I like the, the smell of rain. I like the feel of rain. It clears the air. It just ha- has a refreshing feel to it. And uh, especially since we're not used to it. My in-laws, they love, live up in Seattle. They get a lot of rain. They're not so fond of rain, but they get a lot of it. I, I really do enjoy the rain here in the desert. Uh, spiritually, uh, often our hearts are parched, and that's one of the reasons I look forward to our winter revival with Dr. Getch, is because in, in the same way, what rain does to us physically, spiritually, uh, we find that refreshment from the Word of God. And so we are praying that God would do something special, and that's why we're going to take some time tonight to look at a great revival in Scripture, to see uh, what led up to it, and what lessons we can pull from it, and pray that God would do something similar in our midst. There's a few takeaways that we can take from this passage, and the first is this that now is the right time for revival. If you're taking notes, number one, now is the right time for revival. I was, t- I was typing into a Google search query. You guys know how when you start to type a question, it'll try to predict what question you're, you're asking. It's kind of scary how sometimes, how close it is. But I started to type in, when is it a good time to, and then it started to just Uh, suggesting all of these uh, responses to my question. They started to suggest how I should finish my sentence. And as I typed in, is it a good time to, it filled in right immediately underneath, to buy a house. The next one, to say I love you. The next one, to get married. Uh, The next one, to have a baby. The next one, to invest. When is it a good time to, and those were all the suggested search results. Is it a good time to get married? Is it a good time to uh, have a baby, to buy a house? I'm like thinking, who goes to Google to ask these questions? You know, if you're going to Google to ask these big life altering questions, man, you need, you need some mentors or some friend or, or a good church to go to as well. When is it the right time? 
Well, we don't have to go to a search engine to wonder when's the right time for revival because the time is always right for revival. And that's one of the things that we're going to see here in this passage is that the situation as Hezekiah assumes the throne uh, doesn't look good. It's a dire situation. We find a country that's divided. There's a northern and a southern kingdom. Hezekiah is going to rule in the, in the southern kingdom of Judah. And it's a time where they're divided as a nation and they're also surrounded by their enemies. So uh, just from a strategic national national security perspective. Uh, they are threatened from all sides, uh, and, and, but spiritually they had deteriorated uh, and had, had uh, gone far from the Lord. And so we see the ruin of Israel. And so Hezekiah comes to the throne, and other than David and Solomon, there's more written about Hezekiah than any other king. As we read a moment ago, he comes to the throne at the age of 25. Like most kings, he is the son of a king. And uh, the Bible tells us that his dad's name was Ahaz. And the Bible tells us that he was wicked. In 2 Chronicles 28, verse 1, it says, But he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord. I'm always convicted, by the way, of those verses that summarize an individual's life into one phrase, into one sentence. Uh, I'm always convicted by that thought. If my life had to be condensed into one sentence, what would it be? And for this, uh, this man, Ahaz, he was a wicked king. He didn't do that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He was an, he was an evil king. And so we see the ruin of Israel. Israel's in a, in a really bad spot spiritually. Uh, they're surrounded strategically by their, by, by their enemies. How did they get to this spot? Well, a few things led up to this. First of all, God was rejected. God was rejected. In 2 Chronicles chapter number 29, verse 7, we read, and also they have shut up the doors of the porch and have put out the lamps and have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the Lord God of Israel. So Ahaz, Hezekiah's father, closes down the temple. And now the temple was God's habitation. That's where he manifests his presence on the earth. So essentially what Ahaz, this wicked king, is doing, he's closing the doors of the temple. He's turning off the lights and basically essentially signaling to God, we don't want you here. Your, your presence is not wanted here. So God is rejected. Ahaz rejects God. But then God is rejected. Very soon then he's replaced. So God is rejected and he is replaced. In fact, we find this in Romans chapter number one, where they exchange, exchange the truth of God for a lie. And so uh, some people, sometimes we call it accommodating theology, where you, where you stop believing in something to accommodate something else that you do want to believe in. And that's what happened here for the people of Israel. They were a worshiping people. They just turned their affection from the one true God that had brought them out of Egypt to these false gods that were constantly surrounding them. And you know the history of Israel, that this was a perpetual problem for the children of Israel. So God is rejected, then God is replaced. Second Chronicles 28 verses 2 and verse number 4 tell us that he made molten images for Balaam and he sacrificed in verse number 4 of Second Chronicles 28. He sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places on the hills and on every green tree. Now, the Bible tells us that the Lord our God is a jealous God. He is jealous of our attention. Isaiah 42, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. So God was rejected, then God was replaced. Baal worship was a constant problem. I think I have a picture here of, of Baal, this little idol Baal. And this was, we look at this as a little trinket, you know, but this really had a grip on the children of Israel. This was a constant problem for them. And, and, and the surrounding nations, they had their little trinkets, their idols, their gods. And, and Israel wanted to take part. And they continually looked to the other nations. And they wanted to be like the other nations. And they, they fell into this worship. And they worshiped Baal. And they, they sacrificed in the high places. Uh, the, father, the, the problem progresses further. In 2 Chronicles 28, it says... Uh, and he walked not in the ways of the kings of Israel and made these molten images unto uh, to Balaam, this Canaanite god. The word Baal means owner, the god of the, the weather here. So God is rejected and then God is replaced. You realize that we're made to worship? It's not a matter of will we worship, it's what will we worship. And some people don't have you know, time for, for church, but then they'll make time for a football game. 
I think if, if someone from Hezekiah's day or uh, in biblical times were to step in our culture, I think that they would look at our strange gods too that fill stadiums and uh, capture our affection. And so idolatry still exists today. We can look at this like, oh, that's, that's ridiculous. Who would, who would, whose heart would be so um, obsessed with something like this? And yet we do the same. And so uh, God is rejected. God is replaced. So they are still worshiping. They're, st they're not worshiping in the temple where God told them to worship. They're not worshiping the true God. They're now in the high places to the false gods uh, performing pagan rituals. The worship continues. They've just rejected God and replaced him. And then what happens next is wickedness becomes rampant. When you remove God from society, society deteriorates. I enjoyed the revival reading we had on Sunday night. We heard of the revival that happened, uh, that, uh, uh, that happened over in Wales. Uh, and, and as a result of the revival, there was the bars were shut up. The police officers had nothing to do except for to sing in gospel quartets, right? Uh, but when God is rejected, the opposite takes place. And we see this deterioration of society. And you, you read here in 2 Chronicles 28, verse 3, it says, Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnon and burnt his children in the fire after the abomination of the, uh, of the heathen whom the Lord hath cast out before the children of Israel. And so here we have Ahaz even even to the point in this pagan worship. And you can go to the Holy Land today and you can still see these Canaanite pagan Altars where they would sacrifice their own children. So wickedness became ran, uh, rampant. There's a verse in 2 Chronicles 29, verse number 11, where Hezekiah is, is, is charging and, and, and leading a charge to bring back true worship. And he says, My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, that you should minister unto him. And so here's a call for even us as believers. We see the wickedness of society. We see the deterioration, but we are called to action. We're not just to sit back and say, well, that's just how it goes. No, for us to see it, not do anything about it. He says, now, don't be negligent about this. Listen, we are the, we are the, the, the pillar and ground of truth as the church. We are the, we are the salt of the earth, the Bible tells us. And so wickedness came, became ran, rampant. So Hezekiah comes to the throne and God leads him to uh, stir up this incredible revival in the children of Israel. So what led to Israel's ruin? It's the same thing that has led to our nation's ru ruin. It's an abandonment of, of God and godly principles, which is inevitably re replaced by false idols and false ideologies. And what happens is wickedness becomes rampant. So Hezekiah leads this return to worship. Let's look at what this return to worship looks like. He does a few things here in Scripture. I'm going to pull most of these from 2 Chronicles chapter number 29. In verse number 5, he says, And he said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves, and sanctify the house of the Lord your God, and carry forth the wickedness out of the holy place. So sin had brought ruin. The, the, the doors of the temple where God's manifest presence was, was there with his people had been, had been closed. God's presence had been shut out. He had been uninvited from, uh, from the nation of Judah. And yet uh, here, uh, uh, Hezekiah calls for a return to uh, the sanctify the house of the Lord. So what does returning uh, to worship look like? What does it look like for us as believers? I believe, first of all, we need to examine our hearts. As you, as you maybe find a moment in the next few days before we uh, lead into this revival meeting, would you find some time to do what Hezekiah uh, charged the priests here to do to sanctify now yourselves? We you prepare yourselves. That's what we did on Sunday night with the Lord's table. We examined our hearts. Uh, David had experienced a time of personal ruin, and we see this national moment of ruin. But this happens to us personally, and I think of uh, David after a moment of personal ruin, ruin. He prays the Lord to God to create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and hold me with thy free spirit. And so examine our hearts. That's one thing we can do leading into this week ahead of us, is to take some time to say, God, would you, would you search my heart? Our hearts are, are, are wicked. They're desperately wicked. They're deceitful. We can deceive ourselves. 
Uh, but would you, would you pray? Would you allow God to examine your hearts? It's amazing uh, the devices we can carry on our wrists these days. And I don't know if you have an Apple Watch or a, a Fitbit or something. It can literally do an EKG right there on your wrist. You can send the results to your doctors. It can detect uh, irregular type of heartbeats and, and, and notify you of them. It's pretty amazing. We're, we're really in tune with this, right? Because if we got a physical heart problem, we've got a big problem. But what about spiritually? When's the last time you pulled aside to stop and say, God, would you look, not, not, at my, not at my physical heart like a watch can do, but God, through your word and through your Holy Spirit, would you search me leading into this week? Would you show and reveal uh, in my heart, see if there'd be any wicked way in me? So he says to the priests, uh, Hezekiah does, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord. The Bible tells us in the New Testament that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God. So leading into this week of revival, let's examine our hearts. Number two, let's eliminate the idols. Second Kings 18, verse number four, we read a moment ago, says that he removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and called it Nehushtan. So the temple, as God prescribed, was the only acceptable place for God's people to worship. And yet worship and pagan worship was taking place all over the place. Uh, it was taking place in the high places, and we read of this multiple times throughout the New Testament. We know that there's different religious activities that occurred in these high places. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 3 tells us that there are animal sacrifices. Jeremiah 3 2 tells us that in the high places there was prostitution that happens. 1 Kings 3 3 says they burnt incense. Uh, Jeremiah 23, or, or, or excuse me, 32 says that there was the daughters walking through fire, human sacrifices. In 2 Kings chapter number 20, all occurred at these high places, these pagan wicked places. And so Hezekiah comes in and he removes the high places and he breaks down the images and he cuts down the groves. And here he is. There's a lot of kings in Israel, Israel, not many who did right in the eyes of the Lord. But here Hezekiah comes and he does a few things right to the glory of God. And one of them is he he removes the high places. Places. The Bible tells us that he break into images and uh, break the images and cut down the groves. So we've got the groves, the graven images. Then it makes reference to this serpent. This is the same serpent that we read of in Numbers chapter number 21. It says, And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that a certain per serpent had bitten any man. When he beheld the certain brass, he lived. This is a great story. Maybe you remember it from a Sunday school when you were a kid, when that, that serpent, that great picture of Christ. And Jesus said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So this is a great picture, right? But they had turned this picture into an idol. They're worshiping. This, was, this is really a great story in, history's, in, in Israel's history. And yet they began to worship that. You know, maybe there's something in your life that's not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, but it's become a God thing in your life. And that's what happened here. There was, a, there was something that was even a good thing, a good picture in their past that they had begun to worship. And so they have this brazen serpent. It's been said that idolatry, idolatry isn't confined to shrines and pagan temples. It re resides in the hearts of people who look to other things to give them what only the Lord can give. Second Kings chapter number 17, the, the passage before what we read tonight, um, we read of Hosea and he, his name means salvation. So it's promising. Maybe, maybe this would be a good king. But then you read right off the bat, it said that he was an evil king in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel that were before him. So he was evil, but in a unique way, the Bible tells us. But then all through chapter number 17, uh, the children of Israel are, are commanded. And we read again and again this phrase that they, they, they needed to feel the Lord, fear the Lord. And we read of it first in verse number 7 of chapter number 17. It says, For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which brought them up out of the land of Egypt, from under the land of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. And it says, And then walked in the statue of the heathen. So we see this downward spiral. And then we read it again and again. I see it in verse number 25. They feared not the Lord. In verse number 
Uh, 29, it says, how be it every nation made gods of their own and they put them in the houses of the high. So there's this improper, proper idol worship. They didn't fear the Lord 12 times in chapter number 17. We find this encouragement that they should be fearing the Lord, but the reality of that, they, they did not in fact fear the Lord. They looked to other things. They feared other nations. They looked to, and they respected. They didn't have an awe and respect for God. They had an awe and respect for other false idols. It was a constant problem. Everything else consumed them. Everything else occupied the place that only God should occupy. And that's what idolatry looks like. Look at the last verse of chapter number 17. It says this, so these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images. Catch the irony there? What, what a weird mixture of worship. So the nations feared the Lord and served their graven images. Isn't that how we like to do it too? We like to come and as Jesus said, this people, they draw nigh unto me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. We like to do what 2 Kings 17, verse number 41 says, that we want to say we fear the Lord, but then we serve other graven images. We do other things. We go to church, we have the bumper sticker, we're proud of our church, we express love for the Lord, and then we do other things that we shouldn't do. We, we, we put other things, and, and maybe it's media or a relationship or materialism that has occupies our heart. What occupies your heart tonight? You can say you love the Lord, we can say we love the Lord, we can say we're out here of a pure heart, but then if our minds and our hearts are, are constantly occupied with something other than the Lord, we're guilty of the same verse, saying that we fear the Lord, and all the while worshiping whatever our heart desires. Our hearts have a tendency to stray uh, far from the awe and respect and attention that the Lord deserves. And so maybe there's some idols that need to be taken care of in the days before revival. There's always things that are gonna call our attention. There are things that are even good gifts from God uh, that if we're not careful can become an idol. I think of Abraham and his son Isaac. Uh, what a great gift from God, but to love the gift more than the gift giver, even that in and of itself is idolatry. So let's examine our hearts. Let's eliminate the idols, whatever it is that has our affection, that has our attention. And let's enter his presence. So we see here that he, in the first month, year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. So here it is, I'm, I'm, I'm told from study that this is during the time of the Passover. And so a Hezekiah comes and he repairs the house of the Lord. Um, he, and, and he does this in the first year of his reign, in the first month he opens the house of the Lord and he repairs them, essentially inviting God's presence again. You see, God had not left them. God had made a covenant with them. God was a good God to them. He was a gracious God. In fact, uh, we read of this in 2 Chronicles 30, verse number 9, as uh, Hezekiah is making a proclamation. He says, For if you turn unto the, Lord, your, uh, uh, unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion uh, before them that lead them captive. So shall come again unto this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you uh, if you return unto him. Isn't that a great truth about revival? It's not us pleading for God to come back to us. It's us returning to God. God doesn't leave us. He won't leave or forsake us. That's a promise that we have in scripture. But so often we drift away from him and revival is simply returning to him. And so let's enter his presence. And very practically, uh, Hezekiah, he, he repaired the doors of the house of the Lord. Uh, he, he opened the temple back up for worship. And so enter his presence. And then when we do that, we experience God's peace. So this is what returning to worship looks like. We examine our hearts, we eliminate the idols, we enter his presence, and in doing so, we experience God's peace. Second Chronicles 30, verse number 20 says, and the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. And, and, and they experienced peace from uh, their enemies. They experienced peace in a time of troubles. Second Chronicles 30, verse 25 says, and that dwelt in Judah rejoice." so that there is great joy in Jerusalem. There's something joyful about being right with the Lord, isn't there? And here they are, they, they, they restore true worship, they invite God's presence back in, and what does that bring? It brings back joy. There's a lot of cheap counterfeits to joy. There are a lot of people that are searching for uh, meaning and peace and fulfillment and happiness, but that cannot come apart from the Lord. And that's what revival it is. It, it, that's what David said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. 
Now is the right time for revival. And now the moment is right. We, look, we can look around like Hezekiah did, and things were bad. They were really bad. Like People were getting sacrifices. Children were getting sacrificed. They had rejected God, pagan worship and practices and prostitution. Yeah, that was a great time for revival. And can I tell you something? We're living in a great time for revival. Now is the time for revival. But then we see that revival brings resistance. So nowhere in Scripture do we find a promise that when we come to God and we experience revival that all of our problems go away. Uh, we, we, we talk to the teens about this at teen camp. You know, great decisions are made on top of that mountain at teen camp. As soon as those teens get on the bus, the devil's going to fight that decision every step of the way. So maybe one of the ways that you can prepare for revival is just to expect a little bit of opposition. Expect some car problems maybe this next week. Uh, maybe expect uh, someone, a decision that you make and you, you vocalize or you live out this decision and someone discounts that. Or maybe someone will mock you and make fun of you. So we see here there's some resistance. Uh, I see, first of all, there's mocking from within. Uh, we read in, in uh, Second Chronicles here, and Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also unto Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. So he's inviting everyone to worship. He's inviting everyone to the Passover. How does everyone respond? Well, not everyone's happy because then we read in verse number 10. So the post passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh unto Zebulun. How do they respond? We read here in scripture, but they laughed them to scorn and mock them. Not everyone is going to be excited when you follow the statutes found in God's word. When you stop cussing at work or you, you pass out a track, you invite someone uh, to come and be a part of a service here, or you, or you, you stand up for truth uh, in maybe a, a public setting or a workplace or even in a, at a family setting. Not everyone's going to be happy with that. And that's what happened here. There's joy in the land, but some people took opportunity to mock and scorn. Listen, the world doesn't get what we're doing here tonight. The world doesn't get what, what's going to go on next week through our revival meeting. But that doesn't matter because we don't do it for the Lord. We do well, the world. We do it for the Lord. And they were mocked. So there was mocking from within. I think that hurts sometimes. And I've heard even testimony from within our own congregation where it's, man, it really hurts. I, I heard this just a month ago. Uh, uh, some cutting remarks from a family member. I mean, it hurts when it comes from anybody. But, but this family member says, what are you doing here? What are you wasting your time at that church for? And that hurts. Not everyone's going to be excited when we follow God's will and God's plan uh, for our life and for our church family. And so there was mocking from within, but then there was threatening from without. And so we see in 2 Kings 18 verse 7 that Hezekiah, he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. That's a good rebellion right there. He rebelled against the king of Assyria. And we'll talk about the leagues that Hezekiah's father had made with the Assyrian king. But he said, you know what? I'm not going to honor those. I'm not going to pay tribute to, to pay you off to kind of keep our country at peace. We're going to trust the Lord. So he rebels against that. And that brought threatenings from without. So we'll see here in a moment what that looks like. But there's mockings from within. There's threatenings without. We don't have time to develop this, but I also want to point out, if you study the life of Hezekiah, there is also testing from above. So there are, there are moments where people mock from within. Uh, there are threaten, threatenings from without, other countries, the Assyrians. But then there's also times in Hezekiah's life where there were things that God allowed to come in his life to try him and to test him. There was uh, sickness. Uh, there was, notably at the end of his life, there was, there was pride. And there, here's one verse, I'll read it to you uh, in 2 Chronicles 32. How be it in the business of the ambassadors, this is this moment of pride in Hezekiah's life, of the ambassadors of the prince of Babylon who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that he had done in the land. Listen to this. God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. Isn't that a great verse? that God allowed this moment to try Hezekiah. By the way, Hezekiah had pride in his heart. And I think it's interesting, isn't it? When we find the recipe for a revival uh, in, in Scripture, that we find that we, we're to humble ourselves. We, we, we read in Proverbs that pride is disgusting to God, that God hates pride. It's the first things listed. And here's a man that led Israel in national revival, but here towards the end of his life, he's got pride. What does this tell us? None of us are exempt from pride. None of us uh, uh, heading into this revival shouldn't take opportunity to examine ourselves 
and to walk humbly and to humble ourselves before the Lord. And so uh, there's this testing from above. There's this, ch- this chatter from without, this, this mocking uh, from within as well. So we see now is the time for revival. Revival brings resistance. When we determine to live for God, not everything, in, in fact, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that as believers, we can expect additional adversity uh, when we live out our faith and how that plays out. But I want you to notice finally with me, and this just kind of plays right into our theme for the world, uh, for the year. Trust makes the difference. I want to point this out. Uh, Hezekiah, we read it a moment ago. Look at verse number five. It says that he trusted the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. Isn't that a great verse? But what is it in Hezekiah's life that was the determining factor? What is it that stood out in his life? It was his trust for the Lord. Uh, I take comfort in the fact that Hezekiah, he was not a perfect man. I I mentioned a moment ago, he had some crises. He had some moments where he did well, and then he has moments where he doesn't do well. But overall, he trusted in the Lord. And we're trusting God and trusting the Lord for revival. Why? Because trust makes the difference. I want to look at a moment of trust and we'll end with this, this small snapshot into Hezekiah's life, this moment where he trusts the Lord. So there's a new king in Assyria, Sennacherib, and he comes to Judah. And the first time he comes, Hezekiah, he caves in and he gives Sennacherib this, this silver and gold. And we read of this in, uh, in uh, the middle here of chapter number 18. So he caves in and he, he gives them uh, this gold uh, to this, this king to really buy off their safety and, and, but this wouldn't be the end of it. Again, they would be threatened by the Assyrians. The Assyrians were known as incredible archers and they, were, they, really, they really had the upper hand. And it tells us here that in the third year of Hezekiah's reign, uh, the, the, northern, the kingdom of the north fell captive to the Assyrian ar- army. Uh, have any of you guys ever been uh, just uh, troubled even at the, at the situation of someone else? Uh, this had to have been unsettling for Hezekiah to watch uh, the, the northern tribes uh, to be conquered by the Assyrians. So Sennacherib comes in, the northern tribe comes in, and they take the people uh, who lived there in the northern tribes and they disperse them everywhere. And I wonder if Hezekiah is thinking, I'm, I'm next. This is it's troubling to see that occur to a, a neighboring country, to once your, your country. And so here again, uh, we have this, this man, we're introduced to him in scripture here in, in chapter number 18. And we read in verse number 17 about this man, Rab Shaka. What a name, huh? That just sounds like a da- bad dude, Rab Shaka. And he comes to Jerusalem. He went up against uh, Jerusalem. And then when they come up, they stood by the pool and the conduit of the upper pool, which is the highway of the fuller's field. And when they had called to the king, there came out to them Eliakim, the son of uh, Hilkiah, who was over the household of Shebna, the, the scribe of jo- uh, Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. So Rav Shaka says unto them in verse number 19, Speak ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is wherein thou trustest? So they come, they surround Hezekiah. Why why does this happen? Well, because Hezekiah rebelled against the tributes that his father had been paying. They'd been bribing off this country to keep Assyria at bay. And so they stopped paying that tribute. Uh, uh, the king of Assyria sends Rob Shaka to go and basically uh, see what's up. And that's what he's doing. He's shouting out uh, on, on, on there to, uh, to Hezekiah. And then he says, Thou sayest, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? So the king of Assyria is mad because Hezekiah rebels against this league. And as you continue reading, Rob Shaka comes and he's, he's leveling all these threats against them. And he says, now, behold, thou trustest upon the staff of the bruised reed, even upon Egypt's making reference to another alliance. And if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, unto all that him that trust on him. But if he say unto me, woe, uh, say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God, is not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away. So Rob Shock is really kind of just like shouting lots of nonsense. He's really kind of maybe getting in the heads of some of the people that are listening, demanding in verse number 23, 24, that they pay tribute. And this was unsettling for Hezekiah. And so we read, let's continue reading here. Uh, verse number 27, uh, he, he makes even some vulgar threats. You can read that yourself towards the end of the verse. Verse number 28, Rob Shaka stood and cried with a loud voice. In the Jews' language, 
and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king of the Lord, king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. And it tells us that the, the, the people of Israel, they, uh, they didn't respond as, uh, Herak, uh, as Hezekiah had done. And so here they, they're speaking the, the, the language that the, the, the children of Israel can understand. They're laying these threatenings against them. Hezekiah wisely says, don't respond. By the way, when people are outside of the property yelling at him, the best thing to do is ignore them, right? Amen. And that's what happens here in this passage. Hezekiah says, just ignore them. Here's a crazy guy with a megaphone here in scripture, right? Saying crazy things. Really, you read it. He's saying some crazy things. Hezekiah says, listen, just let him be. Don't respond to him. And the Lord's going to take care of him. And by the way, the Lord does take care of him. And Isaiah says, listen, he's going to fall on his sword. And spoiler alert, that, that comes true. But Hezekiah comes in this moment and he does a few things right. And I want to end with this acronym of trust. Because I believe the first time Hezekiah is approached by this king, he goes and he gives him treasures from the temple. And that wasn't a wise thing to do. Really, he was going to the right place, but for the wrong reasons. He was trying to work things out on his own. But here we find this great picture of trust this time around. So let me give you this acronym. What can we do when trouble comes? And we'll end with this. First of all, take it to the Lord. Number Letter T, take it to the Lord. We read here in scripture, and it came to pass... When the king heard it, that he rent his clothes. And this is uh, verse number one of chapter number 19. When the king heard it, he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. Can I just say this? When you're hurting, when there's trouble, when you're worried, there's no better place to go than to the house of the Lord. Amen. He went to the house of the Lord and he, 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 he rent his clothes. He covered himself in uh, sackcloth, the Bible tells us. And this is what we're supposed to do. Psalm 55, verse 22, cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. What does he do here? We read in scripture that he goes and he physically lays his burden to the Lord. He goes to Isaiah and he said unto Isaiah, thus shall be your master. Thus saith the Lord, be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard which the servants of the king of Assyria has blasphemy. So this is Isaiah, God's prophet, helping to calm Hezekiah to give him context for what's happening. Behold, I will send a blast upon him and ye shall hear a rumor and ye shall he shall return unto his own land and I will cause him to fall by the sword of his own land. And spoiler alert, that's what happens. God took care of his enemies. So Hezekiah, look at verse number 14 of chapter 19. And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. So he receives this letter of threatening. So there's this rumor of war and Rob Shaka and, and all, his, all his minions, they get this rumor of war and they got to run off to war, right? Just as Isaiah says. But they leave behind this letter. It's a threatening letter. And it says that Hezekiah took this letter and he went into the house of the Lord and he spread it before the Lord. You know, that was what we're supposed to do as believers. We're supposed to cast our care upon the Lord. When your heart is, is troubled, when there's a difficult situation, maybe it's financial, maybe it's a physical, uh, maybe it's relational. You know what you should do? Take that to the Lord. Go to the house of the Lord. And that's what Hezekiah does. He says, Lord, I'm, I'm, laying this, I'm laying this to you. I'm trusting you on this one. Take it to the Lord. So what can we do in our trust? You have a problem, you have a burden, take it to the Lord. Letter R, recognize the greatness of God. Look at verse number 15 of chapter 19. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwelleth between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heavens and earth. He recognized the greatness of God. The reason we run to God in prayer and we cast our, prayer, prayer, our care upon him is because, listen, we serve a great God. Amen. One of the reasons we don't run to God like we should is because we don't have a right view of who he is. And here Hezekiah says, you're, you're above all. You stand alone. There's no one like you. You, you, you stand above all of, of heaven and earth. Above, you're set apart from all the kingdoms of earth. Sometimes our prayerlessness is rooted in a low view of God. We don't really believe that God can handle this situation or handle the difficulty. So we don't run to him as someone that can, that, can, that can handle it, that can take care of it. And so 
take your need to the Lord, recognize the greatness of God. He's greater than any problems. He's, 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 there's nothing that's too hard for the Lord, Scripture tells us. So let's take our worries, our needs, our prayers to the Lord and recognize his greatness. And then what we should do, letter, letter uh, U, is unload our problem to him. Now, how many of you know someone that unloads your, their problem to you? Like you're the person that someone else calls, right? Uh, maybe if you, if you don't know of anyone, maybe you are the person that calls someone else to unload all your problems on someone else. And we do that. We have a tendency to do that. Sometimes we, we complain. We, our society has taught us to air out all our grievances and issues. So if, we, if our plane is running late, we hop on Twitter and uh, we don't do this, right? But other people do this. They'll, they'll complain about this and we'll leave a Yelp review. We air all of our grievances, right? Uh, we unload our problems sometimes in places where uh, nothing can be done. Take your problems to the Lord. That's what Hezekiah does here in verses number 16. He says this, Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Lord, uh, th thine eyes and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, whom thou hast sent uh, him, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. Hezekiah says, uh, God, would you would come down close? Would you be, bow your ear to me? Sometimes my kids do this to me. When they have something really important to tell me, my daughter Quinn will want me to come down and get on her level. And now I'm now on her level and I'm looking her in the eyes and she'll, she'll whisper into my ear. And why? Because she, she wants me to make sure I'm getting it. And that's what Hezekiah does here. He says, Lord, can, can, can you come a little closer? Can you bend your ear to me? Can you look at me when I'm talking to you? Can I have your full attention? By the way, uh, he, we have his full attention. And that's one of the reasons we can come to him. And then Hezekiah, what he does, he just kind of unloads on the Lord. Now, he's not complaining to God. He's not a complaint about God, but he's taking his complaint. He's taking his issue to the Lord. We complain all the time to people that can't do anything about what we're complaining about. Let's take our problems to the Lord. Let's cast our problems to him. You continue reading verse number 17. Of a truth, Lord, the king of Assyria have destroyed nations of their land and have cast their, uh, the gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hand, wood, stone, and therefore they have destroyed them. So he's, he's, he's describing, now God is already aware. He's not making God aware of the problems, but he's really, if you're going to go somewhere, if you're going to cast your care upon anyone, take it to the Lord. Take your problem to the Lord. So take your problem, Lord. Trust and recognize uh, the greatness of God. Unload on him. Uh, uh, let, your, let the situation be known uh, to him and then seek help from the Lord. Look at verse number 19. It says, Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand. Now that's not the most eloquent prayer in Scripture, but it really got the point across. And sometimes in moments of desperation, we don't need to be eloquent. Uh, we just need to be clear. And here, here he said, Lord, here's my request. I'm seeking help from you. Will, will you save us? It's pretty clear what he was asking from the Lord. So take it to the Lord. Recognize the greatness of God. Unload your problem to him. Seek help from him and him alone. And then we'll finish up in verse number 19. He continues by saying that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. What does that tell us? It tells us to treasure the glory of God. So why does he make this prayer? You know, sometimes we're, we're guilty of praying selfishly. And we do this. We all do this. We, we, we bring our petitions before God and God tells us to. Uh, the Bible instructs us to bring our prayers and our requests to the Lord. But sometimes we want to do it because we want to feel better. We want this problem resolved. And here's what Hezekiah is praying. He's praying, Lord, Will you do this so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God and even thou only? He's making this prayer for the glory of God. We trust God, not just for our own good, although it works out better for us in the long run when we trust in him, but we trust him for his glory. Rob Shaka, he asks a good question in chapter 18, verse number 20. I want to ask it of you. He says to Hezekiah and he says to the children of people that were within earshot, now on whom do you trust? Can I ask you the same thing? This, this year, the theme of your year is to trust in him, but do you trust in him? On whom do you trust? Who do you run to to unload your problem in? Who do you, who do you uh, think highly of? Where do you take your requests and your, uh, your petitions? Do you trust? On whom do you trust? See, what really matters for us and for Hezekiah was, uh, as he said here in this verse, he says, 
that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. You see, it is the object of our trust that matters. We have a God that's trustworthy. We have a God that is, is good. There's a portion of scripture where Jesus is, is speaking to his disciples. They're attempting to perform miracles and they're unsuccessful. And Jesus says unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have the faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible for you. Here's a great lesson on faith. But it wasn't the, the faith that was, uh, it's not faith that manipulates in some magic way. It is only effective because it is a means by which we access God himself. It is God is the object of our faith. It is God who is the object of our trust. We can have trust in him, not because we are great trusting people, but because he is a trustworthy God. I remember I was with my, my uncle Steve, who we prayed for earlier, my great uncle Steve. I got a picture here. If you would, please continue to keep in prayer. This is just a few months ago. We were able to, uh, to get with him. And every time I ever, uh, almost every interaction I had uh, with my great uncle Steve was something similar to this. Just a really hardworking man. And here he was just a few months ago, a terrible crop they had this fall. And yet he's in the fields harvesting what little he can. And we brought him lunch and he hopped out for a minute. One of my favorite memories with my great uncle Steve uh, was uh, he took me, he guided me on a hunt uh, probably 10, 12 years ago. And while we were walking out on the field uh, in this hunt, he, he stooped down, he picked up something in his hand. I didn't know what he was doing. He was really quiet and he turned to me and I'll never forget the image of his, his hands, his hands that, that knew work his entire life, just these, these, these masculine hands that were, that were tough and yet holding them tenderly. And he, right in his hand, he had uh, something small. I didn't know what it was. And he said, Larry, do you have that much faith? I didn't know what it was. It was a mustard seed. I'd never seen one before. And before I could even answer the question, he just turned around and kept walking. That, 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 that picture has stuck with me. That question. And the faith in and of itself, it's not, it, it's nothing magical about, about the faith. It's, it's the object of our faith. Is that we have a God that is trustworthy, that we can have faith in. So treasure the glory of God. Are you trusting God for revival? Are you trusting him personally for revival? What about when difficulty comes? Uh, because when revival comes, surely difficulty will follow. Are you going to trust him in that situation as well? We have a trustworthy God, a God that we can trust. We're trusting him for revival. Let's, let's seek his help. Let's take our problems to him. Let's recognize his greatness for his glory.